was sitting back there, and I looked back there, and there was a case, and I was like, oh, yeah, it's a case for my guitar. And they said, open it. And I opened the case, and here it was. It, it, this is Christmas 1980, people. All right, so Guitar Stories, episode one. This is a series that I have been planning for a very long time. We're going to be going around town, talking to all these amazing players, and the guitars that have been significant to them and the stories behind them. So I've got a great list of people. If you have anybody that you recommend, let me know in the comment section. But episode one is sweet old Uncle Larry and his 79 Les Paul Deluxe. So very cool stories. If you would, go subscribe to Tom's channel. Show him some love. If you dig the videos, subscribe to this channel too if you want to. So other than that, let's get to the video and uh, let's start the guitar stories. Hello everybody, welcome to Robert Baker's Guitar Stories, Volume 1. Uh, the Nashville uh, edition. Nashville edition, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, I think the concept is for um, certain players to show instruments that are very special to them that they've had for a long time, is that right? Yeah, it kind of gets the story what of the missing? instrument, but also the story of the player. Because mm -hmm. you, you two are going to be intertwined. Right. Well, anyone that is has watched my channel or knows me knows that I don't keep instruments very long. I'm known for buying and selling guitars and moving them along very rapidly. For me to have kept any guitar for any considerable period of time is quite a miracle. Which is why this is the one I yeah, knew to ask about. <laughs> yeah, so uh, this is really the only instrument that I've ever kept. Uh, and I'm, I'm 55 now. And I've had this instrument since I was, oh Lord, 12 years old. Been through some battles together. 1980, then. yeah. So you you want to see it? Yeah. Uh, no, no. We're or, just gonna, we're just show the case. That's that's kind of it. Okay, like, so, um, the the fun story was uh, this is not my first electric. It was my first good electric. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Christmas of 1980. I was 12 years old. Um, I had a couple of really cheapo Japanese copies previous to this. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a really crappy SG copy that was my first electric my brother paid twenty dollars for because he had a little music store and then and then I got a Aria Tele custom copy that was probably fifty dollars but that was the one I currently had at the time of, the, of getting this and I always lusted after Les Pauls I mean I would go into music stores and just look at Les Pauls and I wanted one so badly so you've been a Gibson guy uh, at heart yeah, yeah. from so, the get go yeah so, um, the guitar that I had, the the Aria Tele, I was perfectly happy playing it and everything, mm -hmm. and, and it didn't have a case. So I kept telling my family I want a case for the guitar. So Christmas came along, and uh, you know how like it, when you're in a fun Christmas situation, they always save the biggest present for last. Yeah. So I opened all the presents, and you know, and no guitar it, case, no guitar. So at the end of it. You know, I'm the youngest of five kids, right? So they're, and I was way later than the rest of them, so they always toyed, toyed around with me because mm -hmm. I was like the baby. And uh, uh, at the end of it all, they said, hey, Tom, look behind the couch. There's, a, there's something back there. And I looked back there, and there was a case, and I was like, oh, yeah, it's a case for my guitar. And they said, open it. And I opened the case, and here it was. It, it, this is Christmas 1980, people. This is Cleveland, what, Ohio. What you cold. Saw. Winter day, and there it was. Man. So, um, you know, it's funny. This isn't the the right case. Something happened to the original case, but this is an exact era case. But mm -hmm. I don't, I, I don't know what happened to the original case. But I, I, this is not the original case it came with. But it's just like it. Would it have the orange interior? It was red. Red, yeah, yeah. Not purple. Uh, I think this may be a tinge earlier. This case. Oh, okay. Like this might be like seventy five, seventy six. Guitar is seventy nine. Les Paul Deluxe, you know, not particularly Gibson's greatest era, as we always talk about, the New Orleans era, but these are, you know, late 70s, Les Pauls are known for being boat anchors, you know, yeah. weird necks and all that stuff. And this is no exception, you know. It's, uh, it's a little rare being black. Most Deluxes that you see from late 70s are, are either sunburst or gold mm -hmm. or cherry. Black ones are really rare. Um... There was a model called the Les Paul Pro Deluxe that came out in 1977 that was this exact guitar, but it had white P90s. And you actually see more of those than you do of straight Deluxe that's black. Yeah. I've only seen one other one. 
So it is kind of rare. But it's a 79, and I remember it's got the hideous giant volute. Giant volute on the back of the neck. Uh, I always remembered the serial number by heart because it was the only guitar I played for a long time. 7003955T. So first, the first and the fifth digit are the year. 70039, And the, the three digits in the middle, 003, those are the, the day of the year it was made. So if it was made on December 31st, it'd be 365. Okay. The third, you know, the 365th day of the year. So, 003 means it was January 3rd. It was the finished production date. So, all this wear, I did all that. I mean, I, mean, I played the That's shit cool. out of this guitar. I, you know, I used to have a, nothing, I wear nothing but ACDC t-shirts. <laughs> so, the decal rubbed off all the paint there from the ACDC decal. That's or the Van cool. Halen. And um, it's heavy, and it's got, a, you know, the typical crappy 70s Gibson neck. But it's, it's mine. Do you it's still ever use it on, yeah. on sessions? Not much, but I, I kept it. I've let people borrow it for a long time. I let friends borrow it a lot. And, but I would never get rid of it. I mean, yeah. it's so sentimental. I, believe me, man, I thought about, when I was a kid, I thought about routing it for a full-size humble. Well, so, I mean, I mean I'm surprised I never did, to be honest. I'm surprised I never monkeyed it up. I have put different pickups in it at times. Mm -hmm. I remember I had, I had some, some Bartolini's in it at one point, but I kept the originals and put them back in yeah eventually and they do sound pretty good um but uh i had it refreshed at a time or two kenny lesko my dear friend up in cleveland did it for me uh i think i had some different tuners on it at one point but the originals are back on oh, so it's like all straight it, yeah uh and uh it's heavy it's got to be fucking it's 10 pounds 10 yeah it's probably 10 pounds yeah so is it a pancake? Can you, can yeah, you see it through it? Yeah, but you can't see it because it's all painted. But yeah, um, it suffers. It suffers from late seventies Gibsonitis. <laughs> you uh, remember, like I've had this thing in here since I was a little boy. What is that? It's just the thing I used to put stuff in, like picks and things. Oh, really? It's been in there since I was a little boy. I mean, it has. Well, so every time you open the case, it's yeah. probably it's 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 so funny. A lot oh, a lot this. of memories open in oh, that, my God, that case. It's crazy, right? Yeah, a lot of memories. So. Um, yeah, I'm glad I never got rid of it. You know, I'm glad I never sold it. I've had about 5,000 vintage guitars since this one <laughs> that I bought and sold. And uh, this one's always been special to me, man. And, and my, I really like the fact that my son, Marshall, my 11-year-old, who's a wicked guitar player already. Has he been playing it? He likes this guitar. Dude, that's he, cool. He likes this. And he, he always talks about this one. He, like, he, he, he realizes... It is special to the mm -hmm. family and to all of us, you know. And uh, it's cool, man. I uh, I like this thing. I like to talk shit on it because I can. It's my guitar. It's your guitar, right? You know. <laughs> you know. Remember when John Lennon said, uh, "I can talk shit on the Beatles, but but the Rolling Stones can't." <laughs> <laughs> That's how I feel about this thing. I can make fun of it, but you can't. You can't. Yeah. No, it's great. Um, I haven't played it in a minute, so it's probably all out of tune, but you want to plunk it up? Yeah, yeah. we'll plunk it up. We'll it's plunk a, it up. So yeah. what would have been your rig? Oh, great in, question. In, in this okay, era. Okay, my very first amp was a... I was thinking about this this morning. It's fascinating. Uh, a pig nose, but not the little pig nose that mm -hmm. looks like a shoebox. Yeah. Pig nose actually made some slightly larger combo amps with a single 12. The one I got was called a 3060. It was a 12? It's a single 12 solid state combo amp. And it had built-in distortion. So when I was a kid, my oldest brother who played guitar, Doug, he still plays, he's great. He came home, uh, it wasn't this guitar, but when he brought me that amp, he goes, hey, I wanna show you something. So he plugged a, a guitar, I don't remember what the guitar was, into that amp and showed me what distortion was. Mm, oh. When I was real little. And I remember him playing, I remember him playing, everyone used to play Foxy Lady wrong. He, he used to, he went. That was how he played it, which is totally wrong. But uh, I remember that hearing that distortion come through the amp for the first time and just being like, oh my God. That's it. That was that's, it. That's the sound. Because I had never seen an amp distort or done, done anything like that. I didn't have any pedals. I didn't know what any of that was. Right. So then uh, I, he, I was already playing the shit out of the guitar by the time I was like 12 years old. So he recognized that and he wanted to get me in his band and playing at my mom's bar so he realized he had to get me a real amp 
So I was called the Boy Wonder, and I could play a show, Skinner and Allman Brothers, by the time I was 13. So he goes, I got to get you a real amp, because we're not going to be able to hear you, if you. So they went out and bought me a Lab Series L5 212 combo, which is a terrible amp, <laughs> but and also, also a Norland product. But that's all you can get back in those days. And uh, it was loud. I didn't have any pedals. I didn't even know what pedals were. Um, I, didn't, I just played right into it and with the coil cord and that was it. <laughs> By the way, my family, I, met, I forgot to mention, they all chipped in to buy this guitar for me and guess how much it cost brand new from Willow Music in, uh, in, uh, in, in 80? Willoughby, Ohio. In 1980, 79, 80. 500? 500 bucks. So there you go. Man. There it is. Let's, let's hear this thing. Let's check it out. I'm, I'm right, pumped cool. to hear it. Let's, I'm going to tune it up. <laughs> Rolling? We're rolling, man. Okay. Let me give you a little taste of the kind of songs that I would have been playing on this guitar in 1980 or 81 when I started my first band called Vengeance with Sammy Romano and Andy Pringer. Lots of lots of winger, right? No. Uh, this is this. I'm that old, bro. I'm older than you. Here's the, here's our song list. Okay. Okay. Are you rolling? Yep. You yep, got one? Okay. We, st we might have played this. <laughs> No, we played uh, this one. Remember, see if you remember, remember this song. Is that not the meanest riff? You know it? Fan it's fantasy, isn't it? Yes. Uh, everyone thinks that's Black uh, Deep Purple because it's a total ripoff. It, it Deep sounds Purple, like, like it. Like Deep Purple. But <laughs> that was a big song for us. We played. Uh, uh, We won the Battle of the Bands in East Lake, Ohio with that one. Really? Uh, we also played... Uh, uh, that was a bit later, though. Damn. Yeah, we, we, we did that later. Uh, we, did, we tried to do this one, but we did it bad. Although at the time, I think I played it wrong. I used to go... It's totally wrong. I since learned the right way to play. Right way. Yeah, uh, which a lot of people still don't know. But it's got the tone, man. Oh it's yeah. It's a beautiful tone. I'm playing through a Tweed Deluxe uh, narrow panel and a and a little slap back echo and a big jam distortion. That's another song we would have done back in those days. Uh, my brother's band, we tried to learn. Uh, I remember one of the first songs I ever figured out off a record when I was a kid mm -hmm. from listening, just putting the needle back, was. Um, uh, let's see, how's it go? I don't know. <laughs> And then I started trying to learn all the Allman Brothers stuff. We, we used to do, um, God, what was some of the Brothers tunes we did? Like Ramblin' Man and all that stuff. And uh, got into a little, uh, oh, then it was like I started playing these cover bands that would do all these old 60s and 50s stuff. We did 
you know, uh, uh. money and stuff like that, oh, yeah. you know, and all that. And then we did like, you know, all that. Just the nasty, yeah. any CCR record. Yeah, and then we did, uh, uh, oh, one of the big numbers was uh, Ain't No Sunshine. Phil Withers, we played that. That was in this band called the Cleveland Express Blues Band where I was 12 years old playing with a bunch of guys in their 30s. And we did, uh, you know, a little bit of R&B and sort of raunchy blues in that band. And uh, and then later on, uh, like by the time I was like 15 or 16, I was still playing this guitar. But then I got in bands that were more interested in doing Rush and things like that. You got proggy. Yeah, a little proggy at that point. Yeah, I remember playing in a band called Knight's Bridge where we did, you know, Rush and some Genesis and stuff like that. I was going to say, did you ever yeah, do Genesis? Yeah, you know, it was bad. And then the fun part was there was an amazing band in Cleveland called Fairweather. F-A-Y-R-E-W-E-T-H-E-R. Okay. And Paul Fairweather was the lead singer, and they were amazing. They were older dudes, and they were really, really good. I saw them for the first time in a club when I was 16. I was completely blown away. Unbelievable musicians, Jeff Hutton, the keyboard player, Jeffrey Moore, guitar player. They were great, and, and they had the full-on stage show with all the costumes of Genesis. Oh, dang. Smoke machines, full production. I was, I was amazed. I was so amazed by them. I sat at the Sahara Club and I just watched them. I couldn't, I'd never seen anything like it. Completely blown away. So, uh, I, they had, they played cover songs and then they also had some originals. So I went and saw them so many times that I learned all their originals and stuff. And I remember their guitar player got sick. And these guys were all well in their 30s. Yeah. I was 16. Just got a license. And they, the guitar player couldn't play a couple gigs, and they said they heard about this kid that lived in Willowick that knew all their songs and Genesis. They couldn't believe it. So they got me on the gig. Oh, my God. I played with my heroes when I was 16 years old. I was so green. I didn't know anything. Um, but so happy to be. I could barely drive a car. I remember driving to the gig, and I was, like, scared to death because I didn't, you know, I was just got a license. That's amazing. And I played a gig with those guys, like, my heroes in the... Uh, I knew all their tunes and I knew all the Genesis shit. We played Firth of Fifth and we played all that stuff, you know. And man, that's a crazy memory to think about. And that was all on this guitar. Really? Okay. Yeah, yeah that's, what, that's what I had. So when, I guess, mm -hmm. did you get a second guitar that kind of like... Well, then the heavy metal thing just came in. And then it was like, you know, you had to get a pointy headstock, you know, Floyd Rose equipped guitar. The Ibanez. You know, yeah, yeah, and I got Ibanez. And then I played those for a long time. And then I met Bubba who was my guru, who, when I was about 19, 20, he set me straight, taught me about the virtues of vintage guitars, and I've been obsessed ever since. He always says I was his best student. You know, the guy's an absolute encyclopedia of vintage guitar knowledge, and he, he said, man, why are you playing these pointy hits like Ibanez's? Don't you know about <laughs> PAFs? Don't you know about old tellies and strats? And I was like, man, I didn't know anything about that stuff. And, uh, Man, I just studied with him for, for decades. I still, he's still around and we still talk every week. But the guy knows more about vintage guitars than anybody I know. And, and everything he's taught me, I remember. And, and like, so we just, you know, I just call him twice a day back in those days, asking him questions about vintage guitars, trying to learn. Huh. Kind of like you do with me. Yeah. You know. <laughs> <laughs> every amp I come across, text you like, what do you think about this amp, man? <laughs> Okay yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, I'm passing it on, man. Passing on the knowledge. And um, well, I appreciate that. Oh, dude. Well, you've helped me so much with the silly YouTube stuff that I don't know anything about. I appreciate. It. So, uh, anything you want to know about this uh, thing or any, about my early bands? Well, so so we got the gigs. And like I was saying, do you remember? Is there any like mark or ding on it that you're like, oh yeah, that was I, I, Actually, I don't remember. I, I, uh, this is a good one here, but I don't remember how it happened. It's fallen off the of stands. I, I do remember being at rehearsals where it face first fell Oof. off a of stand, but it didn't break, which is amazing, probably because of this massive no. volute. <laughs> Giant volute. Volute, which is just hideous, but it, it, did, it did its job. I, I almost but, yeah. brought, yeah. Um, to give you, and I forgot, 
So, do you remember the Marshall amp that you had when you had your iPads? Yeah, 32 or 3. I was gonna bring yeah. it. You got one, yeah. You. I was gonna yeah. give it to you, and I was like, I don't know if he even wants this thing. <laughs> oh, dude, that'd be fun. Those were great. I mean, I'll bring it next time. Oh, dude, um, the, the that was when I first discovered like the uh, over-the-top preamp distortion in an amp. I remember the first time I played a gig with that. I was like, wow, that's the, an, that's an amazing sound. Oh I, yeah, yeah. It, it's a it's a decent sound. Yeah, man. yeah. All the heavy metal band kids when when we were growing up all use those. That was what you had to have. Like Mike Zuder and all those amazing Cleveland, Ohio guitar players, they all play those. Yeah. That was the sound. Have you ever thought about selling? Like back in the day, did you think about selling no. this one? It's, I never wanted always... to sell it. No, I, I always kind of knew that I should keep it. I sold everything else that I ever had. I mean, uh, but I always had a feeling about it. I should keep this. I kept this and I kept all my old football cards, baseball cards. I still have all that. Yeah. <laughs> Is, and uh, I'm glad I did, man. I mean, oh, it's, yeah. it's pretty, it would be sad to think that this thing was out there in the world somewhere and, and I didn't have it anymore. You know, and I'm not real sentimental about gear. You know, man, I never name guitars and I don't, I don't, I, I think of them all as tools. And yeah. I think it's kind of funny when people get real sentimentally attached to their guitars. I think it's silly. But this one kind of does have a place. Mm -hmm. I'd be bummed out if something happened to it. I mean, you know? how old were you when you got that guitar? Twelve. 12, so, yeah. and how old's Marshall? He's 11. 11, yeah, yeah. so, I mean, what a cool, I know, to man. see Marshall yeah, yeah. playing that, I know, around man. the same age, it yeah. has to just, it's like, it's cool, man, yeah, it's, for sure. It's as cool as it gets. Yeah, man, and, um, you know, he just got a 61 SG. I really? found, a dear friend of mine um, gave us a wonderful deal on a chopped up old 61 SG, and he's really excited about it. Wow. So that thing is currently being rebuilt. And we sold a bunch. He had a few guitars already, and he, we sold a bunch to get the money to pay for that. Because he had a newer SG. Didn't yeah, he? we sold that. We sold two other guitars that he had, and now he's he's putting that money towards this SG. And it's got original PAS and the whole bit. And that's his dream guitar because he's an ACDC freak. He loves Angus. So for him, he keeps asking about because Nick at Glacius is currently rebuilding it, and he's had it for like a month. Oh, and, okay. and so Marshall keeps asking me, man, when's that thing going to be done? So I called Nick yesterday and said, dude, whatever it takes to put that on the front burner, man, the boy's on <laughs> pins and needles. And he's ready to get that thing back. But the neck was falling off. It, it the, the only thing holding the neck heel, uh, the neck on at the heel was the strap pin. It frets, neck's coming off, but it is, there's no brakes anywhere and it's, uh, Original finish and everything. It's a cool guitar. You just bring it back to life. Yeah, bring it back to life. Yeah, it's gonna be a killer. That's awesome. You know how some SGs with the cherry ones, they, they this one just turned brown. Brown. And then under the bridge, it's vibrant cherry, where you can see where in the, the guard. I love that. But uh, the uh, the finish is like brown. It's cool. Really cool guitar. Man, what these, a cool guitar to have. These don't fade, you know. No, and the um, it's still pretty white. Yeah, I'm surprised. Yeah, the... yeah, it's still pretty, pretty. It's still pretty heavy too. Yeah, <laughs> it hasn't like <laughs> evaporated a little bit over time. That's my biggest beef with all these New Orleans Les Pauls. They're just so heavy, and the necks feel weird. This mm -hmm. neck is just kind of weird. Uh, Flat. It's just kind of weird. Yeah. They weren't. They weren't great. And uh, a lot of people love these. Like Dean DeLeo, he made his his fortune playing a late seventies Les Paul. He loves them. Why? Well, I mean, if you think you like. Know? Uh, John Sykes, yeah, the John '76 Sykes. Yeah. custom. Yeah, yeah. Zach Wild, the '70s. Randy Rhodes. A lot of those guys. Yeah, Ra Can you it's, imagine Randy yeah, Rhodes. He's like yeah. five foot five. I know. Twelve pound Les Paul style. Just killing. My entire body is completely. My skeleton is completely shifted from two things: from playing guitar my whole life, mm -hmm. and from carrying a wallet in my back pocket for thirty years. Right, the right side. Yep. My whole my my one leg is like an inch shorter than the other. My whole if you look at myself in the mirror, my whole skeleton is completely shifted. My sh this shoulder is lower than the others. Leg is shorter, and uh, it's all from playing this shit from from, from that... you know in the wallet thing. And uh, I also wanted to tell you that the fill chart that I made for that one video where I was discussing the fills will be available, <laughs> will be available. to be framed and purchased at auction. <laughs> We got to think of something, uh, a good no, uh, noble cause to donate the money donate to. Donate that too? Yeah. What do you let's think? Let's do it. What do well, you think? So, I guess to, to wrap it up, what do you have going on? Anything you want to plug or talk about? Uh, 
Well, thank you for the opportunity to shamelessly plug something. Uh, uh, I am very excited about the new record that's coming out with Guthrie. I can't wait to hear that. Yeah. Um, how, how close is we that? We made it so long ago that it might be out of style by the time it actually comes out. Um, but we're both uh, really excited about it. And uh, there's been some delays in its release due to... I'm not going to name any names, but his management has been slow to, to get it together. But um, we're going to get it out real soon. All this, the you know, hard work is done. The cover is done. All the liner notes, everything's done. We just got to put it out. And I really am glad. The, the thing I like about this album is that it's very loose. It, we, we didn't spend a lot of time making it real polished. and It's got plenty of mistakes and plenty of uh, rough edges, mm -hmm. which I really like. Yeah. And, um, I mean, there's nothing on there that you go, oh my God, that's terrible, you know, but like mistakes, but we didn't, we, we, we could have made it a lot slicker than we did. And I kind of just wanted to get a lot of first takes on these solos and things. Oh, yeah. And, uh, it's, it's raw. And, it's, and I'm glad, I'm glad, because you can feel that when you hear mm -hmm. the record. It's, it comes across like that. I think it's yeah. the coolest thing in the world when you're listening to a Jimmy Page solo. Totally. You hear him like totally flub totally. a note and you're just like, oh, but I, I can't even, yeah. I can't imagine it not being bad. Oh, like know. that's, that's yeah. part of it. So. There's so many great moments in rock history that were so out of tune. But it would be interesting to hear them like pitch corrected? Pitch corrected. To see what it would sound like. Like the flutes on Stairway to Heaven. <laughs> They're like almost a half step out of tune. Or, or like, on the song "Heaven and Hell," uh, Black Sabbath, mm -hmm. uh, when it, when the verse starts, the tempo drops ten to twelve mm -hmm. beats per minute. Just, it's I like, uh, how's the riff go? Uh, 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 or, uh, remember? Yeah, oh yeah. Uh, and they got that cooking on the intro. And then all of a sudden, the verse starts and it just sags so hard. It's like, it's hard for me to listen to, honestly. I love really? stuff like that, mistakes and stuff, but that one, God, I feel like I'm dragging a tractor through the mud. The bass player is trying to keep it up, but, but the drummer just, <laughs> oh my God. But it's great. I think it's, it's great. Uh, it's better yeah. than being perfect. Right. Well, right? I think, isn't it message in the bottle? Like, it wavers oh, dude, a bunch. Yeah. Like, it's like, 20 oh dude you know BPM how about uh, Hoggy Tunnel Woman it starts it's like 30 beats per minute slower than it ends <laughs> yeah yeah uh, that's that shit's great I, I, it'll I, never I, come back music is once we got once people got used to hearing everything quantized on the grid yeah. and then perfectly in tune that's all they want to hear now have, have you ever heard Bonham where they take his drum parts and, and grid it grid it no it's, does it sound weird you don't want to hear it oh man that's <laughs> fascinating what do you want to talk about what have you been doing me? <laughs> well, this is, no, the whole point of these videos, all they do is see me 24-7. I'm like, this is a good chance for it not to be about me. For Let's once. ask a, a no bullshit question. How do you like Nashville so far? I, I love Nashville. Okay. Um, I think it's been surprisingly like welcoming from everybody. Like, yeah. I, I wasn't sure if it would be yeah. as accepting as yeah. it is. And it, yeah. re it really is, as long as you like... Yeah. It's, it's a great place, man. Yeah. It's a great place. Bulldozing over people or anything. No, it's a wonderful place, man. Yeah. It's still the land of great musical opportunity, mm -hmm. even though it's a bit crowded. It uh, com Coming here made me realize, I'm like, pretty, pretty busy driving. Pretty busy, man. <laughs> driving yeah. through Nashville. And there's a lot of lines for anything you ever want to do. But, man, it's a great place. It's a, it's still, I view it as a great, it's like a, like a, a preserve Mm -hmm. A government-sanctioned preserve for music. Well, thanks for doing this video. Yeah, man. Thanks for shining a little light on this old dog. I, I yeah, you I, know? that was one of the first guitars I thought of whenever I was yeah. thinking of this series of it's videos. Cool. I'm like, it's cool, man. That's a cool one cool. to yeah, man. talk about. It's cool. Then, you want to play it? Play it. Yeah, I'll check play. it out. Let's Get you some. Feel the vibe. I was You gotta tweet Deluxe, because if you don't... I, I don't. I, that tone. When you were gonna come over, I'm Ooh. like, I don't know what to do for amps, because oh, I've dude. got an 800, 
Oh, and right. I'm yeah. like, man. Yeah. Yeah. Another sound like that. Yeah. There, there, that's the sound, man. All right, buddy. Well, any right. any final thoughts on it? Or? No, that's wonderful. No, that right. Thank you, man. That was great. I, I very much appreciate it. So when, when are we going to do the actual take? Yeah. <laughs> so this let is me, the dry run.